Uh, so Ben initially asked me to talk about proteinuria. Then we decided there'd be enough time to do hematuria and proteinuria, so you're getting the double package. And um, first I'm going to talk about hematuria. Now, um, it's pretty easy to define hematuria if someone gives you a specimen like that. That would be gross hematuria. But there is actually a definition for microhematuria in the pediatric patient. And that's if you're seeing greater than one plus heme on a urine dipstick on three urines over three weeks. Um, or if you have access to a lab that will do UAs on a fresh specimen, that would be five RBCs per high power field or more on three fresh urines over three weeks. Now, my caveat is anyone who's submitting their Lab, their urines to a, like LabCorp. That's not a fresh urine. It's going to be eight to 12 hours before someone's looking at it. And uh, so you're not likely to see red cells on a specimen that's been sitting that long. But that's the definition for microhematuria um, and for what we would call persistent microhematuria. The prevalence for single time microhematuria is four to six percent. Um, on a single specimen in school-age kids. That, the prevalence drops quite a bit to a fraction of a percent if you have that, persi that definition of persistent microhematuria. I like to divide <coughs> hematuria into is it upper tract or is it lower tract? And for me, everything in the upper tract is the glomerulus. So <coughs> I'm looking to see if the source of hematuria, whether it's gross or microhematuria, is coming from the glomerulus, or is it coming from someplace else in the kidney or the collecting system? So you usually, it, I will say that RBC casts are pathognomonic for a glomer, glomerular source for hematuria. Um, off, usually, if you're seeing tea or cola-colored urine, that's going to be coming from a glomerular source. Of course, if your dipstick is showing proteinuria as well, um, you might see proteinuria in a specimen with gross hematuria, just the red cells themselves, rather than the glomeruli leaking the protein might be the source of the proteinuria. But if you're seeing on your urinalysis a mixture of other things, proteinuria, WBC casts along with the red blood cell casts, renal tubular cells, then I uh, suspect that the glomerulus is the source. Non-glomerular or lower tract source of hematuria, the RBCs are going to look, if you're looking at it on a fresh specimen in the, under the scope, they're going to be cute little biconcave discs. Um, whereas something that's had to be extruded through the glomerular capillary wall is going to be disformed. Non-glomerular hematuria, clots. You don't see clots happen with glomerular hematuria. Or bright pink or bright red urine, you, that's not an absolute, but um, that makes me think that it's coming from lower down and not the glomerulus. So let's review what we remember about the glomerulus from med school. Um, here's a glomerular capillary tuft. Here's Bowman's capsule. You've got the glomerular capillary cells, the endothelial cells, and lining them are the glomerular epithelial cells, or podocytes is the other word for them. They kind of grasp with their little fingers around the glomerular capillary loop. So the barrier between the red cells and outside in the urine is threefold. It's the endothelial cell, the glomerular basement membrane, and those podocytes. So if, if you have a glomerular source of hematuria, there's had to be some disruption to the cap glomerular capillary wall, some injury. And so somehow the red cell is extruded between the endothelial cells through the basement membrane into the uh, Bowman space. And then the, it gets, you know, travels down the nephron until all the red cells pile up and give you casts. So that's why RBC casts are pathognomonic for glomerular source of hematuria. 
Now, the glomerular causes of hematuria are... Hey guys, thanks for watching. To continue, please log in or create an account for free. Thank you for your support.